I have been using IKEA furniture for a long time now. Some of you would say that I am cheap. But hey, getting a nice piece of furniture for cheap sounds good to me. And no, not all of them are of low quality that would chip easily. The furniture giant now generates more than 40 billion euros in revenues. Let's dive in to see how they made it. At only 17 years old, Ingvar Komprod founded IKEA in 1943 in Sweden. IKEA is an acronym for his first and last name combined with the farm and village name that it was founded in. And guess what Komprod sold at that time? He would deliver seafood, vegetable seeds and magazines using his bicycle. After four years, Komprod developed his first mail-order catalog and expanded his offerings. Later, he decided to add furniture and home furnishings to his catalog. This is what laid the foundations of what was to come. Komprod built upon his furniture offerings by adding high-quality but low-priced items to the catalog. The reason he created the catalog was because the town he was based in was far from the bigger cities. The catalog was an effective way of letting people know about IKEA. By early 1950s, the furniture offerings were a hit amongst customers. Komprod bought a factory and opened a showroom to increase brand awareness. By mid-1950s, the firm began designing its own furniture that would be flat-packed and shipped to customers for self-assembly. The concept quickly caught the attention of more people, and IKEA opened its massive 13,000 square feet store in Almholt, equipped with a restaurant to serve people who were traveling long distances. By early 1960s, IKEA opened the first store outside of Sweden, in Norway. What really boosted IKEA's popularity was the massive store that opened near Stockholm in 1965. It simply blew away a lot of customers. There were two buildings connected to each other. One was circular in shape and had four floors filled with furniture. The other was a rectangular building that had three floors and served mostly as a storage facility. The compound had enough parking for over 1,000 cars, housed a bank, nursery and a restaurant. But IKEA's main selling point was the furniture itself. And to be honest, IKEA revolutionized the furniture industry. The firm managed to secure specialist suppliers who would design furniture to fit in flat packaging. The whole supply chain was altered to maximize cost efficiencies. In an attempt to rethink the supply chain, IKEA introduced product innovations, such as snap locks that enabled customers to easily assemble chairs and tables. And if customers needed help in the assembly, IKEA would send out their staff to help out. Even IKEA's store redefined the furniture buying experience. There would be no salespeople nagging customers. People would roam free in the stores, taking their time and making decisions by themselves. At first, customers would go at the delivery dock to collect their chosen items. Later on, IKEA sold car racks and rented out self-serve vans. All of the firm's strategies won the hearts of customers. More stores would open up in Scandinavia at first in the late 1960s. Then broader European expansion followed. In the 1970s, Komprod moved his headquarters to Denmark to carry out his plans. More stores were opened in Germany, Austria and Netherlands. But Komprod did not stop there. He opened locations outside of Europe. First in Australia, then Canada, followed by Singapore in the late 1970s. IKEA finally opened its store in the US in the mid-1980s. And there, the revolutionary concept was even more appealing to customers. Canada was used as a stepping stone to gauge the Western world's interest in the business. However, IKEA soon faced criticism over its environmental impact. But the company took significant steps to adapt its supply chain. They also updated their environmental policy and began releasing environmental reports. Keep in mind that the whole business model relies on being cost-effective. In a sense, they were already reducing waste by using the strict minimum in producing the furniture. Moreover, their flat packaging enabled many more items to be transported at once. By early 1990s, IKEA had diversified its business across the world. They managed to stay at the forefront of competition by always improving upon older designs or creating totally new products. What also helped the brand's staying power are the rather unusual advertising campaigns. The catalogs, which extolled the quality and design of the products, were very effective. But the actual advertisement slogans had more impact on people. For example, in UK, it was the Mad Swedes are coming. The slogan was adapted for the French and German languages. I have tried finding the actual slogan pictures but it seems that they were taken down for some reason. 
The point is, IKEA used its Swedish origins to build the brand's narrative and image. I guess you could say that the risky move paid off. In the late 1990s, IKEA jumped on the World Wide Web wagon to introduce its website. This is when the catalogs were also made available online. It was not until 2000 that IKEA built its e-commerce platform for Sweden and Denmark. The company continued to maintain its grip on the industry at the turn of the millennium. As they feared European markets would be saturated at some point, they kept expanding internationally. Although IKEA kept growing at an impressive rate, Comprod had no intention of going public. Remaining private meant he could steer the firm in whatever direction he liked, without the pressure from public shareholders. As usual, I have graphed some financials to see how IKEA performed over the years. As they opened more stores and embarked in franchising, revenues grew from less than 10 billion euros in 2000 to over 40 billion euros in 2019. Nowadays, IKEA operates over 430 stores, employs more than 200,000 workers and gets 1 billion store visits annually. Do you get your furniture from IKEA? What do you think about their products? Are there any competitors worthy considering? As always, let us know what you think.